And I liked my business. I liked what I did. I liked my business. I enjoyed it. And I really had plans to grow it bigger and bigger. Because if not, I think I would have just had a nervous breakdown. And mm. I didn't. So when they told me we were going to the U.S., I said, well, fuck, I can't go looking like this. I haven't taken a shower in two days, this and that. I need some new clothes. I'm not going to show up in the U.S. looking like a bum. So I had, the, the, I had money in my pocket. So I had one of the uh, guards, one of the military, go out and get me some nice khakis, a white polo shirt. <laughs> <laughs> and, my, and I had my top siders. I said, if I'm going back to the U.S., I'm going to... You know, I don't want to look like a bum. I, I told Yvonne, look at you, man. You're in shorts, a fucking hat. Take a shower. You're going to look like... We're going to the U.S., motherfucker. We're not going to Kenya. <laughs> <laughs> and he was freaking out. He was really freaking out. And then I said, well, this is the last night we're going to spend. So, you know, I, I gave the captain $200, and I, I asked, let me sleep in your room that has an air conditioner, because that's the last time I'm going to... Be and he with let my you girlfriend. Do it? Yeah, the captain, the Venezuelan captain, and I slept in his bedroom at there at the uh, military outpost that had an air conditioner because that's the last time I was I, I was going to see my girlfriend. Oh, she came by. <laughs> she was with me. She was arrested with. Oh, me. she was arrested with you. Okay. Then they when Eric came in with the U.S. with the, the, not the U.S. Marshals met us at the airport. You know. Um, they put me in, in the Suburban, and they took me away, and they took Shirley to the airport, and they sent her to Panama. Because <laughs> they didn't have anything against her. Mm. And then the U.S. Marshals came, and then they handcuffed me. Hey, guys, if you have a second, please be sure to share this episode around on social media and with your friends, whether it's Reddit, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, doesn't matter. It's all a huge help. It gets new eyeballs on the show, and it allows us to grow and survive. So thank you to all of you who have already been doing that, and thank you to all of you who are going to do so now. Okay. So the jig is up at this point. You're going back to the U.S. You think you might be going for life because you got caught – trafficking on this deal 25 tons of cocaine right yep That's and I, I didn't know the the guidelines and all that and i i knew i was already i knew i was being brought over for the old key west indictment which was 4600 kilos but basically i knew i was going to do a lot of time i didn't really know how the system worked but I knew I was going to do some time. That's for sure. Well, and, well you had left. I'm, I'm just thinking about this out loud. Like, you left in 88. Your father yeah. had died in 83. 82. Yeah. 82. Your mom's still living in the U.S., as you mentioned oh, yeah. a few minutes ago. I got arrested on my birthday. It made the papers on my birthday. So from you didn't see your mom again after 1988? I saw her once or twice. She went to Bogota to see me. Okay. It, it was a real pain to see them. I had to move them around a lot because, you know, I, I didn't want them being followed. Right. Yeah. So, and, and things were getting more complicated as the years went by. It was more complicated, uh, especially when I moved to Europe. Last time I saw my wife, you know, I, I saw her in Barcelona. It was a pain in the ass to get her there with the kids and this and going through, you know, it was just getting more and more difficult. My life was... My world was getting a lot smaller. What did your mom think of what you did? That, like, did she know? She didn't really want to know the details. She knew I was not in anything legal. She, but she, you know, she, she was always telling me to change lifestyles and change, change and change and change and just leave all this other stuff behind and settle down. Did you ever seriously? Well, you mentioned the sugar plantations in 1983, but outside of that, was there ever a point where you stopped and took a breath and were like, maybe I could get out? Never. Thing is, what keeps you in are your commitments, you see? And in my business, I was constantly committing to more and more. I'd finish one deal and I already had a commitment to right. go to another one. So you're always involved in, in a deal. A deal is always going on, so you're committed. So it's not like you stop and you, you cut everything and disappear. So 
And I liked my business. I liked what I did. I liked my business. I enjoyed it. And I really had plans to grow it bigger and bigger. I mean, how much bigger can you get? I mean, I was doing freighters, but then I was already thinking these freighters are a fuck up, the paper trail. So now I'm going to build these high speed, not high speed, but powerful right. uh, open fishermen. And instead of having a freighter with 30 guys on them and payroll and fuel bills, Four guys, they deliver the shit, they sink the boat, I bring them back. Simplify the operation. You I, wanted to get to that. Because I knew the the problem with the freighters. I knew that the paper trail was eventually going to get us. And what got us was that we got infiltrated. And how did that, what, what happened there? What was, what was the infiltration? Who, Some idiot got recruited into the organization. Some guy that should have never been recruited got recruited into the organization as a gopher. But this gopher had a daughter that was studying in the U.S. So he decided to go visit his daughter in the U.S. And U.S. law enforcement already had a, an eye on him, grabbed him at the airport mm. and said, we know this, 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 and that. And if you don't cooperate, we're gonna fuck you right now and you're gonna, you know, you're gonna stay here forever. So they flipped them. So when he went back to Colombia, he was already flipped and cooperating. And I didn't know him. And he just thought you were the Greek. Yeah, I was a Greek. But the organization was already... When I got to Venezuela, we were already compromised. Did you ever think about... At the outset of our conversation, like at the very beginning, and it started to go to this, and I didn't want to go there yet because I really wanted people to get some background on you and your story, but... Did you ever think about like the morality of what you did? Because you, it's not like you were on the end of it dealing the drugs, but you were facilitating drugs around the world that people were going to use and abuse. Was that ever a moral question for you? No. Why not? I didn't think there was anything wrong with what I was doing. Why not? I mean, it's illegal. Because the U.S. government says it's illegal, I think they're mistaken. I think that should be legal. Why is liquor? They decided liquor to be illegal during Prohibition. Right. Huge mistake. Then they legalized it. You know how many people are still in jail for pot mm -hmm. and now they decide to legalize it? You know, my thing was not a morality thing. I think I was very... I was very honest in all my years, and uh, what I did was illegal, but not immoral. At least I think so, because you know what I did. I did time for something that may be legal tomorrow. I think it should be legal. I think the solution. You're in favor of legalizing all drugs, without a doubt. I think it's the only way to solve the problem. There's always going to be a problem. There's always going to be something new. But this cocaine thing, it's gotten to be, you know, the war, it's a lost war. The cause, I mean, it's down the drain. I mean, there's if you if you legalize it, you're going to be able to control it. You're going to put a lot of people out of business, a lot of agencies out of business. So, you know, basically this has grown so big that it's just a synergy between the good guys and the bad guys. But that snowball is so huge and it's getting bigger. What do you mean it's a synergy between the good guys and bad guys? Yeah, the DEA survives because the cartels exist. The mm. cartels exist, you know, not because the DEA exists, but, you know. Cop needs a criminal, criminal you know, there's needs a no, cop. You know, how are people, how are cases done? You know, if you do regular police work, you'll never catch a guy like me. Now, you sit down with a person like me and you talk to me for an hour and you'll find out a lot more than police work will do in 10 years. So... I just think that, you know, cops and robbers is not working. You know, this drug war is a fiasco. There's got to be, be a better way to do it. And legalizing it, you're going to control it. Just like alcohol. I mean, imagine if you had to buy liquor from your neighbor that, you know, made it last night in his bathtub. You'd probably end up dead. Just like right now. You don't know what you're buying. You're buying fentanyl, thinking it's cocaine, and people end up dead. Uh, making it illegal is just making the cartels more powerful, without a doubt. The day it's legal, and you can buy a, 
like a bottle of Johnny Walker Blue, and you can buy a nice gram of cocaine that you know it's pure, it's less harmful to you, and there's no cartel involved. All right, but what about the nature of the fact that because the government did declare it illegal, we can argue over how to properly legislate drugs and whether or not we're doing that correctly. I certainly think we're doing a lot wrong, so you have some points there. But seeing as it was illegal, the marketplace that you have is is run by outlaws. It's run by people who will kill on command. They will kill other people involved. Sometimes they spray that over to people because they're violent people in many cases. They spray that over to people who aren't involved. You then are moving product that might also, you know, it's not like it's it's checked for quality all the time. And it may be going to specific places like cocaine in this case is like considered the rich person's drug. But then it gets disintegrated down into crack and they move it into into poor neighborhoods and create cycles of addiction. You never thought about any of this? No. Because so, you know, look what happened in Gaza. They just bombed a, a food place. There's collateral damage in everything. Mm. Oxycontin. Look at what the Sackler oh, brothers yeah. did. Um, FDA we, approved too. FDA approved. I mean, collateral damage. Collateral damage. You know, war is legal. And, but, and we get involved in war all the time. And I mean, I didn't think about it. I really didn't. I just I was running a business, like it was coffee, whatever. But when you say those things, like bombs in Gaza or the Sacklers putting opiates out there, the connotation I'm taking from how you're saying that is that the people doing that are able to do that, and it's not good. It's evil. So if okay. you are doing that and making money on it, aren't you the same? Let's – yes, you are right. That's a good point. Um, okay. What I'm doing was not – it's not right because – it's a drug. It alters your personality. It can kill you. It involves people that are associated that are not good people. Yes, it, that's, that's wrong. But did I think about it? No. Did I wake up every morning and think I have a guilt trip about it? No. People got killed? Yes. Uh, a lot of them had it coming to them. You know, most of them died of natural causes, natural to the business they were in. <laughs> <laughs> but did I think about it? No, I was very in tune with the business itself and building it up. And maybe, you know, I mean, amoral in that sense. Thank you for watching the video, guys. If you haven't already subscribed, please smash that subscribe button and check out this clip's full podcast episode by clicking here or in the description below.